So here we are again, almost an entire year later, to revisit a pretty hot topic that very few people cover, a dedicated streaming and editing PC. Like the last time I did this, I'm going to make this stupidly clear right off the get-go. This PC will not play games. Again, for the second lot who weren't listening, this PC will not play games. At $550, I just simply couldn't fit in a good CPU for encoding and a GPU at that price. For gaming, of course. That's not to say it isn't possible though, but you certainly won't get good results in editing. I focus more on the actual aspects of editing, this should be a great build if you play on console, but want to edit, record and even live stream at 1080p 60fps without any hiccups. Because of this, I haven't included a gaming graphics card, but instead a really powerful CPU, which is exactly what we're looking for. Now, if you do want to record console gameplay, you do still need to get a capture card, but I'll leave that up to you. And lastly, if you're watching this many months in the future, take a look at when this video is published. If it's many months down the line, chances are new hardware has been released, which also means that you might be able to get better performance for your money. This happens all the time, and whilst this build will work great many months down the line, there's no telling what the price will be, so obviously use your brain and adjust accordingly. Starting off with the CPU, we've got the AMD Ryzen 5 1600 3.2GHz 6 core processor, costing us $200. Now, there's a reason why we went for this. One, it has two more cores and four more threads than the high end consumer KB Lake i7, such as a 7700K. Two, the performance is absolutely insane for the money, and to put things into perspective, a 4 thread i5 costs $200, followed by the 330i7, such as the 7700K which have 8 threads. In this case, going with this Ryzen 5, you'll be getting 12 threads for the cost of 4. And my last point is platform. Whilst the Ryzen platform is a lot less mature than the Skylake and KB Lake Intel platform, it is a lot cheaper too. At least if you consider buying the CPU and the motherboard, which of course is what we're doing because you are building a system. Unlike in gaming where the GPU does most of the heavy lifting, the CPU does most of it when it comes to encoding tasks, such as rendering, x264 video encoding, when streaming at least, and so on. The R5 1600 is a 6 core CPU with SMT, which stands for simultaneous multi threading. What does that mean? Well, it's basically the same as Intel's hyper threading in the sense that it allows multiple tasks to be completed at the same time on one CPU core. Although running on the same core, they are completely separated from each other. This is why, although the CPU has 6 cores, Windows will be under the impression that you have 12 because of these 12 threads. The stock frequency of 3.2GHz isn't bad, but if you overclock, which is free mind you, you will get a bump in performance at the expense of heat. More on that later though. Now the CPU will naturally boost itself to 3.6GHz when performing stressful tasks such as streaming or rendering. The next step will be up to a Ryzen 1700, but that's $80 more, so definitely not within our price range. And so whilst it would benefit us in multi-threaded applications because it has 4 more threads than the 1600 that we're using, it's not worth it. Also, something I quickly want to touch on is the relative performance against Intel's KB Lake. From what I've seen, if you compare Ryzen to KB Lake, Ryzen's IPC is only 9% lower at most. If you now consider that you're paying $130 less for 4 more threads with only a little less single core performance than an Intel i7, you can see that this is a no-brainer. Gamers Nexus also conducted some tests on streaming capability. They paired not the 1600 but the 1700, which is the one we just talked about, against the i7-7700K from Intel and they tested x264 encoding, which is what you'd be doing in this case if you were streaming. Now the results are really interesting, in every single scenario, the i7 actually dropped a massive amount of frames, as you can see on screen now, compared to the Ryzen 1700, which didn't drop any, or if it did, it's only a couple. The overall conclusion was that if you're doing streaming, in this case for x264 video encoding, the 1700 will trash the 7700K. If you're considering buying these parts, do take a look at the results and more specifically the video where the link is down in the description. Now, although we're not using the 1700, we can expect to get similar results, or at least significantly better results on the i7 when it comes to on-the-fly video encoding. I'm not trying to mindlessly crap on Intel here either, but going with this CPU is really a no-brainer. For the CPU cooler, there's no need to buy one. The R5 1600 comes with the Race Spire cooler, which is just like the Intel stock cooler, just a lot prettier and better. It's also really decent looking, which does the job, and it does it well. Onto the motherboard. For this, I decided to go with the ASRock AB350M Micro ATX AM4 motherboard, retailing at $65. This is one of the cheaper B350 motherboards, and doesn't look quite as nice as some of the lower A320 motherboards, but it has one major benefit. Overclocking. You don't need to buy an X370 motherboard if you want to overclock. 
That said, a very good overclock is still achievable on this chipset and by extension the motherboard. That and the stock cooler can easily handle a decent overclock. Anyway, the motherboard is in the smaller Micro ATX form factor, which to be honest doesn't mean much for us, but it does have a host of features. The MOBO supports DDR4 with 3200MHz being the max noted frequency, but I'm pretty sure it can support higher. This is extremely useful as Ryzen CPUs greatly benefit from increased RAM speed, and the difference is really noticeable. Max supported RAM is 32GB, but that doesn't matter for us, and this is done through two DIMM slots. It also has onboard audio and built-in Gigabit LAN, as you've come to expect, so this is how you'll connect your audio and your network cable. And as for a couple of other points, now it has 4 SATA 3 ports, and this means that you can connect up to 4 SATA drives just of the motherboard alone. If you ever want to put an NVMe drive, you can do that as well, because it does have an M.2 port. As for back panel, you get 2 PS2 ports, 2 USB 2.0 ports, and 6 USB 3.0 ports. You also get one RJ45 LAN port and audio ports as well as we just talked about. It does support software RAID, but not SLI, which for the vast majority of people doesn't matter. Scaling performance with multi-GPUs isn't always great. You might have two 1070s in a system, but that doesn't mean you'll get the performance of two graphics cards. Depending on multi-GPU optimization, you can get anywhere from negative performance to almost doubled, though that does massively depend on the game. Other than that, I've heard the stealth cooler from the R5 1400 bumps against the RAM, but with our Wraith Spire cooler being slightly taller, I doubt you'll actually block any RAM slots with it. And as for chipset differences between the B350 and the more expensive X370, there's not really much to be honest besides flashy little features which don't do anything for performance. The X370 supports up to 4 more USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, with a large increase in the max amount of SATA ports. As well as that with the X370 you also get multi-GPU support, which I can't see most people using. It's been said that the X370 motherboards are better for larger overclocks because of more efficient MOSFETs, but even then, I've not heard of anyone who's actually had greater overclocks with one chipset over the other. Kyle from Bitwit, link in the description again, tested the different OC potential between the chipsets and found no difference at all. Either way, this is a budget bought on a good entry-level feature edge chipset, which doesn't have a lot of extra options. That and it's really good value for the money, to be honest. Now for memory, I went with Team Dark, 16GB, 2x8GB DDR4, 3000 megahertz memory costing $130. RAM prices really have spiked in the last half year. It's one of the cheaper, higher speed kits, which doesn't look like it was designed by a four year old. Cast latency is somewhat higher than some of the other modules, which isn't great, but it won't make that big of a difference for our use. The frequency, though, is really important for Ryzen CPUs, even more so if you end up putting a graphics card in it for gaming. That said, you don't actually have to buy faster memory since you can always overclock it. One of the things I barely hear anyone covering is that the speeds you see on the modules themselves, like when you buy it, so for example 2666 or uh, 2800, 3000, 3200, all of that good stuff, is what the RAM is rated to run at out of the box if you enable XMP. That doesn't mean that a slow labelled kit can't be overclocked to the same speed as the higher one, it just means that the higher speed one was bin to guaranteed the highest speed, if that makes any sense. I've chosen to go with 16GB over 8GB due to the impact it has when editing, and whilst more than 8GB won't do anything for streaming, it will give you an improved experience within Windows. Now this price I couldn't fit in an SSD and a standard hard drive, so we've just gone for the Western Digital Caviar Blue 1TB 3.5-inch 7200 RPM internal hard drive, costing $50. Whilst nowhere near as fast as an SSD, it will give you over 8 times the capacity for the same price. That and you can always add an SSD in the future, to decrease boot times, and in my opinion that would be the next logical step if you wanted to upgrade any of the parts, you know, just add an SSD. A mechanical hard drive won't affect stream performance either though. One terabyte to start off with is also more than enough for the vast majority of people. And now for the graphics card, now for this, we went with the MSI GeForce GT710 1GB video card, costing $30. This is basically just a graphics adapter, allowing you to connect your monitors to your PC. This is because not only does the motherboard not have any display ports, but the R3, R5 and R7 CPUs don't have onboard graphics. This means that you have to get a separate video card. Instead of paying $60 to $100 extra for a decent video card, this still allows you to connect your monitors at the expense of having really bad performance in games. But as I've mentioned, I wouldn't recommend this PC for that purpose. A couple of good things though is that it is a passively cooled card with a very low TDP. That means that since there are no fans, the card will make no noise. I mean, there is coil wine, but I doubt this card has any of that. And this is really great for voiceovers and commentaries, etc. Now, I know at this point, some of you will probably tear up in the comments down below and tell me, oh, NVNC video encoding with an NVIDIA GPU or VCE with AMD GPUs 
is so much better than CPU encoding. Using something like NVNC or VCE is where the GPU does most of the heavy lifting. This leads to a massively reducing CPU load by using the H.264 or in case of AMD, H.265 encoder on the GPU to do all of that encoding. It also gives a pretty good image. As for why I said that we shouldn't use it, and that's that this PC isn't exclusively for streaming. It's also an editing PC. So whilst you could get a 1050 Ti and a Pentium G4560, that's a four thread CPU, for the same price, you will have a horrible time editing videos. Because in that scenario, video encoding is massively CPU bound, as the difference between two cores, four threads, and six cores, and 12 threads is insane. The second point that I've got is that this PC isn't aimed for gaming. This is a dedicated streaming slash editing PC, and it's ideal for people who don't plan on gaming on this PC and just want to record such as console games, you know. If you did want to game perhaps in the future or right off the get-go, you can just insert a GPU and the system will now play games. This is much better than buying a weak CPU and an entry-level GPU where you'll have to upgrade both to see a bump in gaming performance. And lastly, X264 video encoding does give a nicer looking image than something like NVNC, for when you're streaming. This was tested by Linus over at Linus Tech Tips where the link to the video is down in the description as always. And so next we have the case. Now with this option I want the Thermaltake Versa H15 Micro ATX Mid Tower case costing $40. And this is excellent value for money. It's a mid tower which only supports MATX or smaller but gives a good number of features for the price. Firstly it's sturdy, has good cable management, it also has proper radiator support but I doubt many people looking at this PC will be interested in that. It also has one five and a quarter inch bay for something like a fan controller and supports up to three drives regardless of whether they're 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch. It also has front panel USB 3.0 connectors as we've got used to. There's no point getting anything less, but it is nothing special. I mean, it does the job and for the price, it was better than anything similar, which is why we've gone for it. And lastly, we've got the power supply. I'm just gonna quickly brush over this because I don't see a point in spending too much time on it. But in this case, we have went for the EVGA 500 watt 80 plus certified ATX power supply costing $40. 500 watts is more than enough even if we're using an entry level GPU. The good thing about this is, is that because we're using such low wattage compared to a 500 watt PSU, we will be round about that peak efficiency. Now this isn't the most impressive PSU by far, but it's cheap, has 80 plus efficiency, and really does what you want it to, to be honest. Anyway, overall the price of this build is $554.58. Without rebates, in the case that it does rise quite significantly in price, have a look at what parts have risen and then just swap them out for other cheaper ones to something compatible. Don't cry about it though, there's nothing I can do about it. In terms of performance, I can't exactly show benchmarks since we're not planning on running games and synthetic ones like Cinebench and Passmark won't tell you the whole story, but this build won't have a problem streaming 1080p 60fps or rendering in Premiere, After Effects, Sony Vegas or any of that. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed this video and if you did and it helped you out, be sure to give it a like or at least rate it and share it with a friend if they're looking for something similar to this. I want to quickly mention that you can always add a GPU in the future if you want, provided that one, the power supply can supply enough wattage to the entire system, two, has the right amount of PCIe connectors, which in this case, no pun intended, the power supply has two 6 plus 2 pin connectors. And lastly, the only concern is that where the GPU fits in the case. Anyway, thanks for watching, this has been Proto, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios! Back from the dead.